So thank you all for joining us today. So this is the fifth season for IGCP648 um, virtual seminar. I'm Luc Doucet, your host, uh, for those who don't know me. And today we are having uh, Dr. Alexandra Yang, Yang, an associate professor from Guangzhou Institute of Geochemistry, uh, Chinese Academy of Science. And she will be presenting uh, hemispheric scale water heterogeneity of the asthenospheric mantle. Um, Alexandra uh, research uh, mainly focused on the composition and the evolution of the mantle, the deep volatile cycles uh, deep in the mantle and links with plate tectonics and their influence on the ability uh, of the earth. So if I'm correct, she will be presenting a paper that's been published in Nature Communication, I think uh, a year ago or something. Yeah. So very recent. Uh, Alexandra, the audience is all yours. You can start whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. And thank you for waiting up for the uh, technical issues to be <laughs> tackled. So sorry, I don't have videos now because the bad internet. Hopefully, the uh, uh, my sound can deliver to all you guys. All right. So to start with, um, I want to talk about the distribution of water in the ethnosphere. So this study is based on the uh, compilation study and also um, my work on the global mediterranean basalts and also on the Arctic morph. Um, this work is a collaboration work with uh, Charlie Johnson from Harvard, uh, Mary Steve from Lamont, and Peter from Tulsa. So in um, plate tectonic theory, uh, water poor atmosphere melt beneath the Mediterranean regions to form new oceanic lithosphere. And after hundreds of millions of years interaction with seawater, um, the oceanic plates would absorb a lot of water like sponge and then um, subducting to the Earth's interior, which releases the water and form the water-rich arc and backer basin mechanism. And we have all learned from classical geochemical textbook that arc basalts have distinct compositions uh, relative to morb, not just differing water content, Arc basalts also enrich in the typically uh, fluid mobile elements, such as lead and uranium. So if we plot global morb and arc basalts in this uh, diagram of canonical ratios, we can see clearly two distinct groups over here. Uh, can you see my uh, mouse over here? Okay. Um, so um, these two groups, would not, uh, there's no overlap between these two groups. Well, such a division actually Im implies that there is a highly efficient net filter in the subduction zones and where the water rich uh, slab flux would not contribute to the convective mantle. Um, but is that true? Are more mantle or dry? Well, the best thing about MORB are two things. Uh, one, MORB occupies 80% of mantle derived mechanism on Earth. And also, they, they are widely distributed in global oceans, like shown by this figure. And therefore, they are the best target to examine global atmospheric conditions. And two, uh, more mostly erupted and cold seawater, and normally would form the gloss um, during quenching at the, at the margin of the polar lavas. And this gloss, indeed, is the best friend of geochemists, as we could directly uh, measure the water content in this gloss using SPLR. There has actually been quite a lot of water data published for more. So out of uh, curiosity, I went on to look at the global mob data from PADDB. We use water to similar issues as the index for the uh, water enrichment in the more mantle. Well, interestingly, we found that um, the water distribution in the ethnosphere is highly um, heterogeneous. We can say Pacific is dry and Arctic mantle is wet. So the question came subsequently. Um, is the heterogeneous distribution of water in the global atmosphere caused by subduction? How much water uh, from the slab actually enters the convective mantle? Well, previous studies mostly concerns on how deep water can be carried down to the earth, but how far water can be carried in the atmosphere remains unknown. And al along, uh, among the labor morb, the Arctic morb, which is the most enriching water, will be more likely to help us answer these questions. Well, till now, the most uh, systematic geological survey cruise on the Arctic Gecko Ridge is the Amor Cruise 20 years ago. Uh, my co-author, Charlie Peter, together with Henry Dick from Woodhide, uh, were the co-chief scientists of this cruise. They sampled 1,000 kilometers along the Gecko Ridge, dredged 150 stations of uh, fresh mob glass samples. 
So here I show the data I collected from all the um, basal samples from the Gecko Ridge. Uh, as you can see that all the basal samples um, stations are shown by the red dots over here. And uh, we have analyzed the major trees and water contents of all these samples. As you can see from this plot over here, um, the water seam ratios actually confirm uh, previous data about the Arctic mantle that uh, they are indeed enriched in water with much higher water to seam ratios than the average uh, Pacific MORP data uh, showing by the dashed line over here. And more interestingly, there are two stations in the Eastern Gecko they have arc-like compositions, shown as the yellow stars. Well, these two judges of MORP samples, um, plotting over here as the yellow symbols in this canonical ratio plot, they show a clear transition from the MORP-like to arc-like compositions in this plot. And there's by the diagrams, shown by the red curves over here, they show clear depletions in niobium tannin and the enrichment in uh, rubidium, barium, thorium, and uranium. So they look nothing like typical more. Instead, they resemble in the um, typical arc facades. Well, the first time we found about uh, special geochemical conditions of these samples, uh, we actually don't believe it. We were worried that maybe there's something wrong with the samples we analyzed in Harvard. So my co-author, Mary, actually went to um, Woodhull to get the archived samples from the more crews and run independent measurements and the results came back totally the same. So we began to realize that um, these arc-like samples are real, and then we need to look more into the uh, gag mob data. Uh, indeed, it is not just these two stations uh, that show the clear subduction influence. If we look at all the gecko mob shown by the blue diamonds here, they show linear correlations in the niobium uranium to serum lab plot. They're trending towards the arc-like samples. Um, in the Eastern Gecko. Such a trend actually suggests a pervasive subduction influence in the Gecko morph. And I have to mention that such a trend is actually absent um, in previous solution data as shown by the great, do uh, great diamonds over here. Uh, their literature data published in Gale et al. mostly. Well, it's likely because of the alteration effect on uranium and the contamination effect on lead for the um, solution-based ICP mass data. So we highly recommend analysis of fresh morph glass using laser ablation for tree elements instead of the solution-based ICP analysis on glass powders. The laser method is a lot um, faster, more economic, and better data quality, especially for uranium and lead. Well, except for these two ratios, there are also clear subduction influence in other geochemical index. Here we plot um, the lanthanum samarium versus thorium niobium and potassium to titanium ratios. As you can see, this uh, gray diamond are Pacific morph. The red circles are Becker basin basalts with clear subduction influence. So we can see from this the two groups that the subduction influence would likely uh, increase the thorium to niobium ratios and potassium to titanium ratios relative to lanthanum samarium ratios, and the Gray diamonds here, they are the gecko morph. They clearly shifted to much higher thorium, niobium, and potassium um, to titanium ratios relative to the green diamonds shown by the Pacific morph here. So combined with the general water enrichment beneath the Arctic mantle, the enrichment in uranium, lead, thorium, and potassium, they all seems to indicate there is a pervasive subduction influence in the gecko morph. Then where is this water-rich flux coming from? If we look at the regional map of the Gecko Ridge, we can see they are surrounded mostly by the continents, um, North America to the left and the Eurasia to the east. So there's no proximal subdition zone available to provide such a flux. But if we look back in time, for example, um, 200 million years and 800 million years ago, uh, this red, this, the red fields over here are where the Gecko uh, Ridge will be spreading in the future. So you can tell that the Furlong plate over here, the Idanagi plate over here are all subdated beneath the Arctic Ocean. So we infer that this slab flux might result from previous subduction events. And interestingly, after the release of a paper in Nature Communications last year, we heard from Ginti um, Toyo Kuni and Dapong Zhao. 
that um, their new tomographic data actually found the previous abducted slab in the mantle beneath the Arctic region. Here we can see Gecko is here. This is the, uh, the slab uh, relic over here. So actually providing further support for our argument. And hopefully the paper will come out soon. Um, so combined with recent plate reconstruction studies, there are multiple previous abduction events in the past 200 million years, as listed here. And we also shine the reconstructed locations of the previous updated slab as the uh, colored curves over here. They show overlapping uh, with the current spreading gecko ridge. So all this previous updated slab could provide this water ridge slab flux, contributing to the water ridge nature of the Arctic mantle in general. Well, yet we know that the previous abduction is not only confined to the Arctic alone. So if our explanation for the Arctic stands, then we shall be able to see this abduction influence in all the locations. And the problem is how to identify the water rich left flux in other oceans. Well, for this purpose, um, Becker Basin Basalt as the juvenile uh, oceanic crust uh, formed beyond the arc with abduction influence can be used as a natural reference to identify the slab flux in more. On this canonical ratio plot over here, BAB, the red circles, plot right between the morb and arc fields, so forming a natural transition from these two distinct groups and with actually similar compositions as the yellow, um, arc, uh, the arc-like morb in, in Gecko we found. Snowy Wing also combined the global BAP data, including the uh, East Scotia Basin, Monos Basin, the Varna Trough, and Low Basin. Well, it is clear that um, BAP, the red circles over here, they mostly plot in the quadrant of lower niobium uranium, uh, serum lead, and higher barium niobium and the rubidium niobium ratios. So, therefore, these four ratios can be used to construct a BAP filter. Oh, it worked like this. If any three of the four ratios pass the BAP filter, um, the rubidium niobium ratio of 0.6, barium niobium of 6, um, niobium uranium ratios of lower than 42, serum lead lower than 22. So the sample can be considered as to receive a slab flux. And it turns out 94% of global BAP can pass the BAP filter, suggesting such a filter is effective to treat slab flux. Then we'll apply the um, BAP filter on global MOB data. Uh, we updated in this study the global database of Gero et al's compilation from 2013, and we added around 3,000 new literature analysis to the Gero compilation that can be used to evaluate the submission signal on a global basis. All the data used are shown as these uh, tiny gray dots, uh, as you can see, the, uh, actually all over global oceans. All the yellow symbols are those samples that actually pass the BAB filter, uh, and we call them BAB-like morph. According to the distribution of BAB-like morph, we could have a general idea on the distribution of subduction modified mantle beneath the globe ridges. Um, if a region have less, have less than 3% of BAB-like morph, we consider the mantle is not significantly affected by subduction, shown by the gray fields uh, like this. If a region have more than 20% of fab like morph, we consider the mantle to be subduction modified, shown by the uh, yellow field. Well, I have to admit that such a division is a bit arbitrary, but a big picture um, of the mantle compositions can be imaged in this way. So it is clear that the subduction modified mantle, the um, yellow fields, are distributed in Arctic, in Indian Ocean, and also in the Atlantic Ocean. Well, which actually is, consi uh, is consistent with um, previous and recent work on regional studies. Well, surprisingly, there's very limited slab flux in the uh, Pacific Ocean, except for the chili rice, where slab window were believed to open. So we then compare the average compositions of the Pacific morb uh, with the Babalak morb globally. Well, Babalak morb show the enrichment in not only uh, rubidium, barium, uranium lead, the elements that were used in the BAP filter, but also rich in cesium, uh, thorium, potassium, water, and strontium, or similar elements which would be enriched in an arc setting. And there are also uh, statistics.
Alexandra, I think we lost you. Statistical variations in ratios that uh, the columns are for the uh, are back, back are now is it good yeah, now? now it's good. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so there are also statistical variations uh, in the ratios. Uh, the gray columns are the Pacific more, the brown columns are the Babylon more. So the uh, potassium to niobium ratios, the thorium niobium ratios, and the fractionation corrected strontium to neodymium ratios, and also water to serum ratios are all higher for the Babylon more than the Pacific more. Well, such a finding actually confirms the credibility of that filter to identify sufficient influence globally and also suggests that the Pacific more is unique in the extreme lacking of sufficient influence. Then why Pacific morb are so poor in subdox and also are so poor in water? So if we take a look at the subduction zones that surrounding the Pacific Ocean, uh, we can tell that all the subduction slabs are continuously um, extending at least up to the transition zone depth. Well, all the slabs combined would form a subduction shield, which continuously deliver the um, water flux to the mantle outside the Pacific uh, subduction slab, but isolates the Pacific mantle from the contamination of such a flux. The reason for us to use shield as um, the subduction slab actually shields the Pacific mantle from the water rich flux contribution. Well, I use a different word in, Ch in Chinese. I'm not sure if Ross knows that. Uh, I will I'll introduce later. Well, Well, more importantly, the oldest Pacific Ocean drilled during the cruise uh, 1148 and 801 over here. Uh, they are typical um, Pacific mob, which cannot pass the bed filter, suggesting the isolation of the Pacific mantle by subduction shield, at least through the past 180 meters. And it's highly possible that uh, the isolation is much longer, while well, considering what Luck um, found out about the lower mantle heterogeneities. Uh, caused by the <laughs> subduction girdle. I think, you know, it's a slightly different name than the subduction shield. It should be the same, right? <laughs> Similar, okay. So I, our study um, would also provide additional evidence for the outflow of the Pacific mantle. It is well known that the Pacific has been shrinking, so does the volume of the mantle beneath the subduction shield. Uh, it's easier to depict uh, sinking the subduction shield as the lead of the traditional Chinese pot. I'm not sure if Australia have pot like this, but it's you know a very typical Chinese one. Hopefully, you guys are familiar with that. So, if you have like in the uh, Jurassic time, you have a bigger lead and you have a bigger areas beneath the lead, but now you have a smaller lead and you have a smaller pot, something like that. And then, where did the mantle go? What? Back in 1981, Everest actually proposed three possible ways for the Pacific mantle outflow uh, beneath the Caribbean Sea, the Drake Passage, and also the uh, Southwest Pacific Ocean. Well, actually, we could judge from the conditions of both sides from the three locations whether these are true. The, the logic is very simple here. So if the mantle flows over where the Pacific like, then the basalt erupted above should also be Pacific like. So uh, I also compiled the data from the Caribbean, the Drake Passage, and also in this part. As you can see that the Drake Passage, they are all shown by the yellow uh, symbols here, suggesting they have a clear subduction influence. Um, so I was, we think it's not likely the pathway, but the Caribbean Sea and also the Southeast Pacific Ocean is more likely to be the pathway for the Pacific outflow. Well, such a you know, result is also consistent with the results from the lead isotopic studies um, by Julian Pierce in 2001. And we could also further constrain the volume of the slab flux in the convective upper mantle. I, I would leave out of the details, but the flux in the global morb is up to 13% um, on average of the flux relative to the flux released in ARC. Well, such a, a volume actually is equivalent to that released in global backer basin of around the like 18%. Well, a lot of you um, might wonder whether such a hemispheric scale mental heterogeneity is related to dipole anomaly, you know, which is more uh, well-known, larger scale mental heterogeneity. 
I'm not sure if they're going to be student in here, so I will give me give a very short introduction on the Dupai. So Dupai is named after Dupin Allegri, who found about this you know large scale lead isotope anomaly originally most occurring in the southern hemisphere. Well, hard to use to the Pacific and the North Atlantic Oceanic basalts as baseline, the Northern Hemispheric reference line here. Um, they calculate the deviation of 2 8 lead to 2 4 lead ratios relative to the NHRL and the name that delta A4. So um, delta A4 over 30 were mostly used as a dual signature. And therefore, we use our new uh, compilation of the data and to uh, plot the distribution of DuPont mob with delta A4 over 30 as the green dose, uh, orange dose in this map. Then, how much of them are actually, you know, bab-like? Well, actually, there are only less than 40% of the DuPont mob are um, bab-like, shown by the uh, yellow symbols over here. And the majority of them, shown by the gray dots, they are actually uh, do not pass the bab filter. And if we plot the water stream ratios with delta A4 over here, we can see the a very you know, extreme deep mob with very high delta A4 uh, have Pacific like um, the, the gray diamonds here, are Pacific mob. They have Pacific like water stream ratios indicating they are actually very dry. They couldn't be caused by the subduction influence. And last but not least, we can see that the eastern, southeast, uh, southeast in the region over here, they are Dupai definitely, but they they were all these uh, grid dots here uh, with very limited subduction input. So combined, we think the subduction influence is not the same as the dual mob, but they all occur outside the um, Pacific subduction shield. As we used to think dual is like more Asian things. So I'm tend to think this subduction influence is an overprint on whatever the mantle hydrogen it is. And such a coincidence might also indicate that the isolation of the Pacific more can be much longer than the 188. So this actually leads to the conclusion of my talk. Uh, we found hemispheric scale water heterogeneity in uh, atmosphere, Pacific dry and Arctic wet. And we found arc-like morph in gecko ridge with water enrichment. And we think it is a, uh, there is a pervasive subduction sub influence of the gecko mantle. The reappearance of water-rich flux in the Pacific Ocean suggests the subduction shield actually isolates the Pacific uh, mantle for over 180 million years. Uh, we think the Pacific mantle escaped eastwards beneath the Caribbean Sea and westwards beneath the southeast um, Pacific Ocean during the past 100 million years. And so um, look also uh, already introduced about this paper. Uh, um, I think uh, we wanted to emphasize that we published an, an updated global mobile compilation in the supplement. So if anyone is interested in playing the data, um, please enjoy. And finally, I wanted to acknowledge all the SHIM members of the Amor Cruz and all my collaborators. This work wouldn't be possible without their efforts. So I'm going to um, stop here and take any questions. Thank you very much for your patience.